something that's always perplexed me is how there are suicidally depressed billionaires. How the people in the first world, where we have all, all this wealth, all these material possessions, how on average we're significantly less happy than people in the third world. I feel like the, the chaos that we deal with on a daily basis is more than our ancestors had deal with their entire lives. And that's just due to how much we basically are forced to deal with technology. Okay, well, welcome. Case Bradford, thank you so much for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast, buddy. Thank you for the invite, Gareth. Really looking forward to connecting with you and seeing where this conversation goes. Uh, awesome, man. We were chatting offline uh, yesterday and because uh, I was watching like some of your, your videos and also like uh, a, a previous podcast that you were on. And I was like, man, this guy sounds like his accent is like, you know, a little bit sort of maybe South African or Australian, like he's like he's maybe he lives in america but he maybe moved there when he was a youngster but but that's not the case at all is it bud no grew up in new england spent some time living in pittsburgh which is sort of a mid-eastern city and then I moved to los angeles eight or nine years ago now it'll be nine years ago this summer so i i've heard people say that to me before they'll say well, what is your accent from like where are you from and it's like wait i speak perfect american you know we're I'm from I'm from new england we invented the American accent, and, it was, and so everyone else has an accent. I speak Norway, but I think I just have over time maybe affected an odd way of articulating myself. I'm, I'm not really sure. No, I mean it's just like it's just an accent. Maybe I haven't heard heard a lot. You know what I mean? Uh, so, so no, it was just, it, it just for me it was quite distinct. That's for sure. So maybe, like you said, you're right. All the other Americans they have accents, and yours is the original one. <laughs> So you, you now live like in, in Venice Beach. I was just wondering, like, what is it like today, but what a place to live, to grow up and uh, explore. Yes. So I'm a bit north of, of Venice Beach. Technically, I'm, I'm in Santa Monica, but the, this is Western part of Los Angeles is, is a really nice, interesting place to, to be um, much more chaotic than the place where I grew up, which was more of a suburban New England town that is a very crazy, uh, chaotic place. and it's unreal because it, it seems like it's almost a, a perfect day every, every day to, to, to some extent. Like, like we were chatting a bit before that started recording about weather and how it impacts your state. And I feel like every day is a nice day, even though it may be sometimes a little gloomy, cloudy, rainy, whatever. It's always, it never dips into the New England sort of polar vortex style day where you're just completely frozen and you feel like you're going to fall apart if you go outside. So that's, that's nice. And there's always sunshine on the way. You, you can pretty much count on there being a sunny day right around the corner, as opposed to weeks at a time going with cold, cloudy days, which can be rough on on, on the body mind. Do you ever crave the cold anymore? Not really. No, it, I think when I'm when I do access it, it, it's nice. Like going in the ocean when it's cold is is nice. It, it's really nice. And other people are walking on the beach bundled up. They look at me like I'm crazy. I'm in my underwear in the water. But it's it's nice. It, it's It's not. It's not something that I, I fear, but I, I do miss something about the wintry days when you'd go outside and it would be very quiet. The trees have no leaves. They're covered in snow and you can see it glistening. That, that I kind of miss. That's very beautiful. I think it's, not, it's nice having like a, a contrast, isn't it? You know, if, if we had, say, like nine months of awesome sunny weather and then like, say, three months of snow, that would be probably just just the right amount or right right sort of um distinction of, of the two seasons there's definitely something to be said about seasons and juxtapositions or or you know having that those polarities where one makes you appreciate the other with it's it's easy to take something for granted when it's always a certain way and when we have fluctuations in anything it's like oh gosh yeah i really kind of missed the way it was or wow, this actually is really nice. Now that, I'm being, now that I'm experiencing what it's like, like when we get sick, for example, that's when we value our health the most because we, we realize, oh, I was taking that for granted. Not, you know, that's not something that's always around. And now that I, I've lost it or am, am lacking it, wow, I really, really value that thing that, that is around. And it's, that's one of the, I think, primary challenges of life is just being grateful for those things instead of taking things for granted. I think about that quite a lot, actually, like about when you are, well versus when you're sick and the contrast is like so when you're sick you're like oh i wish i would feel better you know and then when you do feel better again you feel great right because you've had that contrast of being sick so then i'm like thinking no hang on we must always be feeling great you know what i mean 
Um, does that make sense to you? Yeah, 100%. It would be, that, that's, that's one of the biggest, that's the whole point of life, I, I believe. And when we really boil it down, it's like, how can we feel great all the time? And most people kind of turn to drugs for that or buying things or like this, this, like they're chasing happiness, which seems to be something that is, is just happening by chance. Or these are these events, like tra- people want to be like constantly traveling, for example, where it's like, because they think that's the way to always feel great or just like always buying new things or chasing certain experiences that are going to be riding this certain high. But like, I, I don't believe that's the way to really cultivate a great feeling all the time. It seems like it's more of an inner art to be able to focus on what we just kind of talked about gratitude, appreciation for the normal things in life, for the things that are so easy to take for granted. Yeah. And do you have any like other sort of thoughts around that? Like, you know, where you sort of, um, you know, make yourself appreciate life and what you have more? It's, it's a, it's a big challenge. Uh, Gratitude is one that I've been playing around with more and more. And it's almost become a meme online where it's like, what's your gratitude practice? And, you know, are you, how are you being grateful every day? But it, it's really powerful if, if you do it. I've been trying to do it like before and after I eat, or maybe before, during, and after I have every meal or before, during, after I do training, which is grateful for my body being able to work and, and being able to do the things in a training session. Grateful before and after sleep, like grateful that I made it through the day and that I have a nice comfy bed and a nice dark room. and grateful that I woke up full of energy and where can we, you know, catalyze ourselves and and remember this state that we can tap into and say, wow, this is something that I'm thankful for. I think it actually takes like constant reminder, you know, like, cause, cause humans like they, they, they are forgetful and like, you actually have to have a practice, you know, like I I literally every single morning I will journal, right. And the, the, my journaling is very simple these days. I have the first the first things I write is three things I'm grateful for. And it can be anything like, you know, from flipping the, the butter I might put on my bread in the morning, you know, um, to just like being out, being lying in the hammock and writing my notes. Uh, and, and, and it's literally, it's a good reminder, you know, it's like, wow, this is actually quite a cool thing. And, you know, I think like humans think you need some, you need to do something extravagant or, you know, you need this like pull or whatever it is, something complex to, actually appreciate and be grateful for what you have but it's it really is the the small things that you need to kind of remind yourself about i believe that 100 percent, and that's that's really powerful and it makes me think of something that's always perplexed me is how there are suicidally depressed billionaires right <laughs> or or how, how the people in the first world where we have all all this wealth all these material possessions how on average we're significantly less happy than people in the third world who's their favorite possession, their most powerful thing is like a pair of scissors or a soccer ball. And, and that doesn't, that boggles the mind until you, you know, think about it maybe a little bit deeper. I was chatting with uh, Adam Rossi on the podcast recently, and, and he was actually talking exactly about that. He said he's got people that he knows that are literally billionaires uh, that are, they're depressed, you know, he's like, they're also lonely. And, um, they, they kind of like, it's like, what do they do now? You know, they've got all the money in the world, but they've, they've actually neglected such a huge part of their life and their community and friends and family to become that billionaire. And, um, yeah, they just now are not happy, you know, and, and all they actually need is probably a bit of like human contact or, or somebody to recognize them and, and help them out of that hole. It's a difficult game, this this life game that we play. There's so many different, so many different plates we got to keep spinning. And uh, the second we try and like get one plate spinning better, the other one drops. I've got to get that one back. And then the other one drops. <laughs> it's, it's hard to do. I wish I had eight arms to keep all these plates spinning, but we only have two arms at the end of the day. If, if, if we're lucky, great, grateful for these two arms, you know, some people don't even have two arms. Exactly. But, and I think the cool thing is, you know, is actually, uh, just talking about this is cool, you know, and it's cool for other people to listen because other people will be going, ah, yeah. Okay, cool. I actually feel the same way, you know? Okay, cool. These guys feel the same. And, and that's cool. You know, like you, you're giving other people permission to actually appreciate maybe the chaos that they might have in their life a little bit, you know, because we all kind of, you know, we're, we're all going through that just at, at different sort of levels, I reckon. Definitely. Yeah. That's, that's gotta be the one common thread throughout the human experiences. We're all, we're all facing this tremendous amount of chaos, especially I feel like the, the chaos that we deal with on a daily basis is more than our ancestors had to deal with their entire lives. 
and that's just due to how much we basically are forced to deal with technology. Just all the all the notifications, all the incoming information is just really overwhelming to our at a nervous system level. It's it's very difficult to deal with. And it's something that we're all grappling with on a daily basis. And and that's just and that's just part of it. You know, that's just one aspect of life. We also have the our internal world. We also have to deal with external world and reality, let alone cyberspace. So it's yeah, it's it's quite a hefty load that we all get to deal with these days. Yeah, and it's like because all of this sort of technology is really kind of in its infancy, right? We are we're learning about it really. We're learning how to use it, we're learning how to manage it and and yeah, I think people, it, it feels like people are starting to go, okay, cool. We, we actually need to sort of cut this, cut this down, even cut it out a bit more. Um, you know, do we actually need to post our whole lives online? Um, you know, I think people are starting to sort of maybe twig, okay, cool. This is not necessarily that good for us. Yeah. That, I think some, some people are coming to that realization and, and that seems to be the true, the true path. Other other people are really, haven't probably haven't even come to, <laughs> come to that place yet. You're, you've got deeper wisdom than most people, so it's a good thing you have a podcast and you're getting get the word out there because uh, definitely a lot of people are struggling with it. And what I struggle with about it is this idea that I want to be able to to contribute more to society. I, I want to be able to help people, so that that means basically means I have to use you have to use technology, like to be able to do that. In, a, in, a, in an effective way, like that's the obvious choice. What else could you do? I guess I could start, you know, a local group that meets somewhere outside and, and we do, you know, some exercise stuff. But how do you tell people about that? You know, the best way to do that is by sharing stuff online. So there's really no, no choice to be able to use it. But just like having a gratitude practice, there's got to be some sort of technology practice where we realize, like for me, the, the biggest one is just when the sun sets, that thing is really, the, the use goes way down. Like it's limited tremendously because the most damage that these things do is using them at night, that bright light comes into our eyes, it's into our brain. It tells our entire body mind, hey, it's it's daytime, it, it's light, you need to be awake, you need to be active. And then that destroys our sleep cycles to the point where we're unable to regenerate, unable to recover, unable to benefit from a deep restful sleep. So that would be the number one principle is, is at night when the sun sets, these things have got to, the use has just got to go way down and you've got to use protection. You've got to protect your brain against the bright light so that it doesn't signal daylight to the, to the body, mind and sleep is, is protected. That's great advice. Uh, Cause it, it, it almost, it's what it stops. I think like the sort of melatonin or, or something like that sort of um, production, which is actually what sort of initiates your, your sort of sleep. And uh, you know, in, like you think you're sleeping say those first two hours when you eventually do fall asleep, but actually you're in this very kind of low frequency sleep and um, you, you're missing out on, I think it's REM, is it? The, the, the first bit of your sleep and, and, you know, both are pretty important, um, but that's, that's a very important part of it. And, but you don't realize, you know what I mean? You don't realize until one day, oh, your adrenals are shot or you like having this sort of nervous breakdown and it's because you actually haven't been sleeping. hundred percent. A lot of burnout is, is so popular these days. And I believe, big root cause of that is lack of sleep, which is primarily going to be due to watching TV late at night, using phones, using screens, being blasted with artificial light, even ambient light from having house lights on too bright is, is going to have that effect as well. And that that's such a, a powerful root cause that many are, are struggling with that is really actually pretty easy to solve. <laughs> that, one's actually, that one's actually pretty easy. It doesn't require really much money at all. It, it, you can invest some money and buy like those blue blocking glasses or install red light bulbs on it, but you don't have to. You can just kind of turn the lights off or, or dim them at night, which is, it's pretty cool that the solution's really easy and, and at hand for that one. I got a funny story. The other day we were having uh, something installed in our bedroom and these guys had to drill some holes in the walls and uh, he turned the lights on and we've got red light bulbs. <laughs> and he just... <laughs> Him and his mate just like looked at each other and they started giggling. I could see, and they were just thinking, geez, these, this couple's into some funky, funky stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it, it, it's not really, it's just like we, we have red light bulbs installed because for that exact reason that it's, it's actually much better in the evening to have red light. 
So yeah, uh, funny. You 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 just got to sometimes be uh, you know have a sense of humor when people come over to your house. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny how like there there are a lot of these. Uh, I don't know. You can call them like biohacker or sort of health techniques and tactics that really are just kind of funny when when people who don't know anything about them come across them like have these of these uh earthing sandals and they're just like pretty goofy looking objectively like they look like something a, a roman person could wear back in back in the day and uh when i walk around with them i often get some funny looks people are looking at them like oh, i've never seen any sandals like that before <laughs> what is this guy what is this guy doing but um and i don't and you know part of me is like oh i'm, I'm grounding you know these these sandals have uh got me connected to the electromagnetic energy of the earth <laughs> that would just that would just make them think i'm even crazier so it is it's pretty hilarious that once you start learning about this stuff it kind of almost at some point you just become become like a crazy person no absolutely but as soon as you mention like earthing or emfs whatever they're like cheaper this bloke has lost it you know what i mean <laughs> but fortunately you know in one way like fortunately we have the internet and these platforms because it actually allows us to find our tribe and group, you know, so we actually can go fit in, you know, like, and go, okay, cool. I'm not really that mad that I like to go walking outside barefoot after the lightning. Cause it's great for, you know, energy and, and stuff like that. Um, there's more of us out there that, uh, you know, that, that believe the same. So anyway, but just looking at your, your Twitter feed, uh, you have a very like witty and almost like sarcastic sense of humor, which I love. Like, has that kind of always been the case for you? Thank you. I'd say, yeah, it, it runs in my family in a sense. My parents were funny. My, my grandparents were funny. The sense of humor has always been just a part of our, our family culture. I don't know. If, sometimes I think sense of humor is something that is maybe in, like, it's either part of someone or not. Like, everyone has, Gifts. You know, some people are are very cognitive, analytical, intellectual. They can solve math problems without a calculator. Some people have just like an extra sense of like if you're hurt, they know how to make you feel better. They're they're able to be like really empathic. And other people have like a sense of humor, which is almost to me, I perceive it as a shamanic ability to be able to to help someone laugh. And and laughter is really powerful. It, it can help like diffuse tense situations. It can help people feel better, more comfortable. And I I think if if I've been given the gift on, on some level to be able to create things that are clever or comedic, then it's, it's my responsibility to, to try and give that gift to the world in, in some way. But it's, yeah, that's an interesting one that, that I like to think about and maybe overthink it, but it's, uh, it's, 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 yeah, always been a part of my family and I'm grateful that it's been, you know, nurtured and, and not something that's suppressed by, by the people that raised me. Yeah, that's cool. And uh, like, I mean, I can imagine, like I read some of your posts and I'm like, uh, he's actually he's actually not being serious yeah but like somebody is totally gonna take this the wrong way <laughs> yeah that that almost makes it funnier when when people do take take things then they take me seriously when i'm i think it's pretty obvious that i'm joking it makes me laugh when that happens so i'm always trying to sometimes i like to try and write things that could be like taken either way to maybe uh like trick somebody that there's a bit of a trickster energy to what i like to to bring to the internet um commons because i one thing I, I do observe is a lot of people take take life really seriously and then the internet they take the internet really seriously and i like to try and throw curveballs out there sometimes because it's it's just fun I, I totally agree and and that's like that's literally it, it almost seems like half the issue that we are dealing with at the moment is that people have lost that ability to have fun like you know you, you've only got a, sh a short amount of time on this planet seriously like you know, do you really want to be super serious about absolutely everything and like just forget that, you know, you're actually designed to laugh and to enjoy yourself and it's really good for you chemically to do that and stuff. And it's, um, yeah, but it's, it's almost, I feel like it's almost like sort of beaten out of us the older we get, you know, like we forget how to have fun. It's really deep observation and, and something I've, I've seen as well. If you were to, if you were to guess, what do you think? Is it with why do you think people are like not doing not having fun? Why are people taking life so seriously? Why? Um, I don't know. Maybe I, I don't know that they, they they're isolated. Uh, they uh, they lack community. They they're fearful of what people think. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, those those are three good reasons. I, I think maybe maybe another one could be like I was I was learning about. There's this this concept called 
regulating the nervous system. And a lot of people might, may have dysregulated nervous system, which kind of like gets them stuck in like this fight or flight mode where they're taking everything really seriously. And yeah, some combination of all those factors seems to be really limiting people's, you know, inner child or sense of playfulness. I think that one makes a lot of sense because if you think like, you know, maybe the older you get, the more responsibility you have and then the more worries you have, like, you know, like now you got to pay tax and you've got to fill in this tax uh, uh, return that you have no, no clue what you're doing, but you, and you feel bad for doing it because they make you feel bad for doing it. And, you know, then you get a, I don't know, something else in the, the post, like a fine or whatever the story is. And you're like, oh, yes, yeah, I, I, you know, that's not me. I'm not that type of person. But then it like sort of, like you said, it's it sort of um, almost suffocates you. And you, you start losing that, that essence of, of who you are because you, you have these micro anxieties that you kind of worry about. And maybe that takes the fun out of you. That's a great point. Yeah. And you can even, even add in the, the piece that we spoke about before with, well, the two pieces we spoke about for like the lack of gratitude and then also the tech, like the lack of sleep. And then even with that technology, the overwhelm of information, but also the characteristic of that information oftentimes is just is the news getting you to be afraid of things where you know you've got these large organizations that are just bombarding bombarding us with fear porn essentially just trying to get more clicks trying to scare you as much as possible so that they can make more money like their business model is is predicated on just booking people out so you've got the you've got that you know on top of it it's yeah there's so much working against us and i, I do believe that the foundation of, of a high quality of life is tapping into that inner child and that sense of playfulness. And that's just, it's so key. It's been so key for my mental health. And I hope to somehow spark that in, in more people. And that's, yeah, that that's a, a really powerful way to look at life, in my opinion. You recently wrote on Twitter about like uh, community and, and meeting people and stuff. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I wanted to just sort of read it out and then, um, ask you a question around it. So this is actually like halfway through the tweet, the, 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 the tweet. You said, this is something I'm always working on. Um, I've been hell of an introverted and reserved my entire life until the past few years. Um, quick conversations, jokes, compliments can lift someone's day and change their entire life. Maybe we could just talk a bit, little bit about the introverted part. Like, um, I guess any reason for that and, and like, how did you sort of come out of it? I think the reason was lack of confidence just really self, um, not, or had a, had a really low self-esteem growing up. I had acne and braces and it was just for some reason, really uncomfortable in my body and didn't like speaking. Like, just always felt uncomfortable. <laughs> just like talking to other people and didn't really feel like I had much to say. Like I always, I've always been somewhat calm. Um, just like, the waters of my mind have been more shallow. Like a lot of people, I feel like always have things to say, things to express, but I'm, I'm not that way. So it, it would, that would also make me feel uncomfortable because I would never know what to say. <laughs> so it, I don't have anything to say. I feel uncomfortable saying it. And it was really uncomfortable being me. And, and this lasted through most of my life. It wasn't until my late twenties where I started being comfortable with myself. And I think that was just a byproduct of maturity and just getting older <laughs> But it's like, okay, like, yeah, this is, this is who I am. And, and then over time, it, it's also realized all of these things are just skills that, that can be practiced. Like a, a big revelation for me was understanding small talk and looking that as just playing jazz. Like it doesn't really matter so much what words I'm saying, more so that there's the emotion behind the words and just speaking from the heart, for example. Like I'm not, even right now, I'm not, planning these words out, replying them. I'm just, it's just flowing out of me and I'm moving my tongue, my voice box in whatever way is, you know, required to get these thoughts out there. But that was a practice like that didn't, that didn't, you know, come, come naturally to me. So it was, I think, looking at it as a, a skill that I could learn and then just kind of forcing myself to do it. And then as I did that more and more, um, just became more involved with social media, making podcasts myself. And now it's, it's, it's much more in the realm where I can, create community around here so i have group chats on instagram and, and twitter for locals who live in los angeles who are like-minded because i knew i was very lonely in my 20s 
believing what I believe, not being able to find others who believe the same things and creating community around those ideas. And we'll go meet up at the beach and play spike ball or train. And it's just trying to create healthy ways for people to connect. That's not like going drinking at a bar, for example. So that's something that I, I try and do a little bit, but it's, it's difficult and, uh, but it's worthwhile to, to engage in. Do you find that where you live, I mean, you live in California, do you find that there are like a lot of like-minded people yourself? Not really. It, I, I expected there'd be a lot more when I moved from New England. There, there definitely are more like-minded people than there is in the Northeast, but, and it's increased over time, but it's still, most people are still, you know, of the same, like American mindset's pretty, I think, prolific throughout the United States. It, it moves a little bit. Based on where you're located, coastal regions seem to be a little bit more health minded, I think, because you go to the beach and then like you're, you know, everyone's looking at your body. So you, maybe you're a little bit more health minded for that reason. But there's also the fact that oceans themselves bring health benefits. So people are benefiting from sunshine and, and this, the minerals in the air and the culture of being barefoot a little bit more often. So there, there are some other factors at play, but. Yeah. Interesting. And one, one of the things I'm assuming you're mentioning is like negative ions that are sort of released by, you know, waves and, um, and, and that sort of stuff and, and many other things too. So like people don't even, people are not even aware of like what nature does to us, like without us even knowing, you know, like those negative ions, who knows what they even are, how they exist, but they just kind of like, ex like sort of bring down your sort of, uh, stress and anxiety and stuff. And, you know, that's why going for a walk on the beach is always kind of so soothing and nice and enjoyable or in the forests when the wind is blowing. hundred percent. Yeah. Neg negative ions have got to be the most powerful and underrated aspect of vitality that is present in our reality. And it's basically boils down to being out in nature, ideally barefoot because we can get negative ions from, from the earth. So the earthing, being in the forest, being at the beach, just like you mentioned, that, that's such a powerful way to access higher vitality. And in the forest, by the trees, they also release things called phytoncides. So there's trees are just out there emitting invisible gases. And these things go into our body and they, similar to negative ions, elevate our mood, increase our immune system, decrease our stress levels. There's so many benefits to going out to nature. It's the most powerful way to elevate vitality. And it's, it's free. It's not something, you know, but so many people are turning to supplements, adaptogens, uh, different dietary routines when the most powerful way to increase health that I've experienced is getting outside as much as possible with as few clothes on as possible, just barefoot outside in nature. That's the best way to increase the foundation of our health. Everything else is kind of like scaffolding on that foundation. A hundred percent. Um, you know, one of the things that I like, really like about your training and stuff is, you know, you, you're always outside. You generally, well, I've only ever seen you barefoot and, uh, and shirtless and in the sun. And, <clears throat> you know, that's like a complete contrast. If you, if you think about like, you know, what, what it is when you walk into a gym, you go into a gym where, you know, the equipment is artificial, you know, it's not artificial, but it's made. Um, the lighting is, is sort of artificial lighting. Um, and, uh, you're wearing your shoes. Um, and you, you got this crazy music pumping, you know, and, um, it's literally the complete opposite to, to nature. And I'm not saying like, I, I used to be a gym bunny and loved it, but now when I think about it, I'm like, ah, actually, you know, it's, there's probably a better way to do this. Oh man. Yeah. I'm, I'm really passionate about this one and I'm, I'm trying to create more around it. The, you know, part, part of it is, is environmental. I think you're probably more, we're, we're more drawn to the gym when you were living in London, I, I imagine because it's. It's definitely more difficult in certain areas to do what we're doing to where training in nature, I think it can be done anywhere. And I imagine at some point I'll be living in a Northern climate and I'll be able to experience this firsthand, but the beach is, is the best gym in the world. There, there's, there's no comparison. I would take a flat beach with no equipment over the <laughs> most loaded gym with every piece of equipment any day of the week. And I could maintain a very high level of fitness with just a flat land of, of beach. And, and honestly, it would be a much higher level of vitality, which is, you know, goes beyond just muscle capabilities and, you know, my cellular energy, my functioning of, of every mitochondria within my body, mind would be functioning at a higher level as, as a result of training in nature, as opposed to being stuck indoors. And we, we'd kind of touched on some reasons why, but it's, it's a really powerful way to, way to approach free time, which is like, we, you know, I'm stuck inside working on a computer most days, like most people with my free time, I want to use that to keep myself 
operating at a high level and that kind of necessitates training in nature, like combining modalities. I was writing about this literally this morning. I was like, most of us, right, when we are 80, we're going to look back on our lives and we're going to go, Jesus, I spent a third of my life looking at a screen. I mean, that is like, that is depressing. <laughs> if you think about it, like you got, you probably a third of your life you're sleeping, a third of your life you're looking at a screen and, you know, doing whatever else you might do with the other third. Like it's, it's pretty hectic, you know, like, I mean, when you think like the beauty that exists outside and we've replaced it with this silly screen um, because we have to work or, you know, whatever we call this. <laughs> well, it's, you know, there are cool, a few cool things come to mind that I think are happening. One is that like the, the screen doesn't necessarily have to be so harmful and bad. And I, there are people working on better technology to make the screen more human friendly to the point where interacting with it won't feel so bad that the lighting, the way that it's set up, it could be, it could be more aligned with, with nature, the way that we like, imagine if looking at your computer felt like looking at, at a cool plant. And then to the point where you could use it outside. So they were not stuck indoors. These things are happening. I think the Daylight Computer Company is the name of it. Um, not that I'm working with them or plugging it, but it, this is like a new technology. We, we're, we're coming to these realizations and people are working on it. We can improve all these things that are vexing us. I, I'm really optimistic about the way things are going. And at the same time, yeah, we have to, we do have to work a lot. <laughs> it's like, we're, we're, you know, but it doesn't necessarily have to be so soul sucking, I believe. And then with our with our free time, yeah, getting getting out in nature, making that a priority is the best way to balance it. Because a lot of us are you know, right now we are stuck using this this these machines that are harmful or um, devitalizing, and we can choose to spend our free time in ways that are really vitalizing, as opposed to then taking our free time and like watching TV and drinking beer and just like further devitalizing. We can choose to be outside exploring nature, inhaling all the elevating chemicals and negative ions and sights and sounds and, and beautiful experiences that are nourishing to us at a soul level, as opposed to staring at a TV screen. Absolutely. Um, it actually reminds me, I don't know if you've recently seen uh, Chris Williamson, who runs the Modern Wisdom podcast. He's, he's done some sort of uh, amazing interviews. Uh, he's recorded in, um, in Austin at, in his like, studios that the, the background uh, feels like they're in, I don't know, some crazy movie, you know, but also like a lot of them are, are like uh, nature scenes. And it almost like makes me think like what you're saying now about like, you know, how you work, if they could make you think that you're looking or you're working in a forest or something like that, you know, imagine you had this, like, I've got this, you know, big wall as you do behind your computer. Imagine if like, it felt like you were actually in a forest, like they were, they're actually flipping cool. <laughs> yeah. If you could be if I could be barefoot in a forest working on a screen that wasn't made with like flickering bright blue light, if I could look at it in the sun, it wouldn't be so bad. I mean, th there's definitely ways that we, we can create a, a cooler world through our innovative capacity, through our creativity. I think we all possess within us the, the gift of creativity. We can create a cooler world for ourselves. And as we do that, we can help others create a cooler world too. Like all, the, all these problems and issues that vex us, there are solutions to them. Even something like, for me, a standing desk is, is a big deal. I used to suffer from a lot of like back pain and, and just being cramped seated at a desk. Just one simple change was adding more movement and that makes it a more human-friendly environment, being able to stand so my, my blood can flow, my lymph can move, and I'm, I'm able to get a little bit more just freedom and liberation through that. That's, that's, a, that's a big one, a small one that a lot of people can, can access and improve their, their quality of life. I had a standing desk the whole time when I was like uh, doing the podcast uh, in London. And then uh, we, we, we left and went traveling and now living in Brazil. And like, I, was just, I just had my, uh, my, my chair uh, and, uh, and desk and I was sitting in my chair for a long time until about, I don't know, about six months ago. And I was like, mm, I've got to change this up again. You know, like it's not serving me well because my back was really getting sore. You know, my lower back, I've, I've always had like this weak lower back. And um, since, since I've put my standing desk up again, it's amazing, you know, because you constantly, your core is constantly getting used, you know, and you're constantly, you're actually able to move like, you know, and, and do a little bit of stretching if you want and that sort of stuff as well. And uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a huge win is, is getting that uh, standing desk. Yeah, it, it's life-changing to be able to, and 
I remember when I first got it, it was hard to do it all day. Sometimes I would take breaks to sit. But you get used to it. You acclimate to it, adapt to it. And now it's, I don't have a single chair in my office. That's, that's a little, that's a little, if people are struggling with it, they're like, oh, it's hard to stand all day. Just take the chairs out of your office. Then you have no choice. <laughs> Before you know it, you'll be able to, to stand because our bodies are very adaptable and they will be able to do what we ask them to do if, if we keep asking. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I was also uh, chatting to you a, a bit of time ago and uh, you did, I think, your first trip out of the country. Uh, you went to New Zealand, which is like an epic place to to visit. So well, what was it like? Like, what was it like getting out and sort of experiencing New Zealand and other another culture and country? It was amazing. What a what a magical place. New Zealand is is mind blowing the natural beauty that they have there. And it was a little bit funny driving on the opposite side of the road on the opposite side of the car. And then the directional, like the blinkers of the car where, where the windshield wipers are. So every time I went to turn, just like turn the windshield wipers on by accident instead of the blinkers. There's there a little bit of chaos. It was really amazing. It struck me how many cows that they had, just ruminants in general, goats, cows, llamas, sheep, just everywhere, all over the road. There's beautiful green pastures and the people were so nice. And it was, it was really a, a magical place. I, I could definitely see myself living there for, for a period of time. It was, it was much, much uh, nicer than American and in some ways, whereas it's sort of tucked away. And I feel like it's more of a secret spot that people don't know about. <laughs> it certainly is beautiful. <clears throat> I've actually driven on, on both the islands, like around them. And yeah, their natural beauty is just sort of a next level, uh, you know, like an, and like a huge contrast as well. Um, deserts and, um, you know, um, like ski slopes and um, amazing fjords and just, it's just incredible. Um, the, the vastness of it for such a small little country, really. Yeah. It, it is funny to think that it is an island that I guess technically, and it, but it doesn't really feel like it does have some island vibes like in a way it was somewhat similar to Hawaii in, in, in some ways, the way that it was so lush and green and yet also had beautiful beaches, but it didn't. And it also had that sort of Polynesian aspect to it. Where, where you've got the, the Maori and some of their culture is still there. And it is a beautiful, very cool culture. And, and yet you've also got this more sort of rugged European, um, like herdsman type aspect to it, where you've got a lot of cows and, and the, that whole part of the culture, I think is, is really interesting to see those two mixed together, which is big part of, of what makes New Zealand unique. And, and I imagine Australia as well. I haven't, haven't been there, but also you've got some of that on, on Hawaii to some level where you've got these blending of, of cultures, which is just like, wow, this is really neat and unique place. Yeah. Well, you'll go, if, when you go to Australia, you'll see it's actually like, it's very different to, uh, to New Zealand. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I say that, but I think lots of countries are actually also very similar, you know, like, when you when you get to travel around countries like you see the natural beauty exists everywhere um so it's just a matter of actually actually going and finding it because I, I i truly believe that every country is extremely beautiful I, I haven't really visited one where i'm like wow the sun sucks <laughs> you know most of them have been really cool um just talking about like cows and wool and sheep and you know and and all that stuff like you know like it's prevalent in new zealand um did you manage to pick up any sort of wool clothing? Because I know that you are big into that. No, I, I, I didn't get any. I did look around and it's interesting. There was, there were natural fibers are really inter has been an interesting part of my journey the past year or two years, just learning about the detriment caused by polyester and just these petroleum based plastic fibers, essentially. That I w woke up to that and I was like, wow, everything I own is polyester like what is this stuff and i guess it comes from petroleum and it's made in china and it's a very chemical intensive process and a lot of these chemicals end up on our skin and in our bodies and that's not so great and let alone the environmental impacts like when these things are disposed they don't really break down and when they do it's like gnarly chemicals and then just waking up to the fact that like oh there are these alternatives like wool or cotton or linen or leather i guess technically uh you know there, there are these things that are more earthy and 
don't leach chemicals into your body and into the environment. And the kicker is they're a lot more comfortable to wear too. It's this real awakening that's happening that it's it's one offshoot of that, like this awakening of like, oh, we've got to kind of go back to the earth in a lot of ways because there's so much quality of life to be had in eating real food from nature and spending our free time out in nature and wearing clothes that are more aligned with mother nature. And, and then these, these are, um, I did there. They, they had this other one, uh, possum fiber, which I'd never seen before. I guess, I guess <laughs> like possum fur, which is kind of interesting. I, they like gloves and socks, but yeah, it's, that's been an interesting one. And, and New Zealand definitely does create a lot of merino wool fibers, which which is one of the more interesting natural fibers that that is being used right now. And one of the ones that I've sort of read about is linen, and uh, they talk about uh, these um, clothing's having uh, frequencies, and uh, you know, like uh, they say that linen is the best one. You know, it's like the most energetic uh, sort of material that people should try and wear because it's actually really good for your body as opposed to like polyester, which is almost like a negative um, energetic frequency. It's quite fascinating. It is. And I don't know enough about it to, to speak about it on a deep level, but I've read that as well. And I've listened to podcasts about it. It's gone in one ear, not the other. It's like some this deep, it's kind of one of those things where if you talk about people are just, <laughs> who's this guy talking about frequency, but it is, it is what I like to, compare that to is just like how comfy it is because linen is very comfy if you wear it, it's just like oh this, this is good like it feels good to have this on as compared to then you put on like polyester and it's kind of like sticking to you it feels like you're plastic wrapped in a way it's just like oh, this doesn't it doesn't feel as good but to me frequency just means like comfiness or like comfort and just like how it feels to have on because it that is true and that's something you can feel like the second you put it on you'll feel it um wool, wool is another one it's just like wow this is Comfy. It can be a little scratchy sometimes, but um, also just very comfy to have on it as opposed to something that's basically plastic. That's a good good reminder because I think a lot of people like you, you almost get too carried away, like and and too technical about things. Whereby you could just go, okay, cool. Well, how does it make you feel? And you're like, oh, it makes me feel great. So, okay, cool. Well, then you know, it, it probably is good for you. <laughs> you know, I, I just want to say, food food is often the same way. Where people will be like, oh, is this? Like, is this healthy? How many grams of protein is in this? Like, what are the vitamins and nutrients? So, how do you feel when you eat it? Like, that's ultimately just eat what makes you feel good. That's a healthy diet. That you know, what? There's no real reason to overthink it to, to much degree. It's like a lot of these things are so much simple, so much more simple than I think they're, they're made out to be. And it's, yeah, it, I love embracing that and trying to share it because a lot of these things become overcomplicated and just like really confusing when ultimately at the end of the day, it's just focus on what makes you feel good. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that definitely like write about these things and like, you just like, okay, you've probably lost 99% of people with what you, you're writing about. You know, you should just really try to simplify what you're trying to say. And um, yeah, I mean, just one thing I would like probably add to that, you know, is like when it comes to food is like, is how does it make you feel maybe long-term because, you know, ice cream makes you feel awesome in the first like say to five minutes but uh <laughs> what does it actually do in the next sort of couple of weeks sort of thing or the next couple of hours but but talking about ice cream <clears throat> you you're also really big into uh raw milk uh you you talk a lot about like homemade ice cream and stuff as well and uh what's what's your kind of take on on raw milk so i'm currently writing a book about ice cream seeking to publish it in in early june because it's such a topic of of fascination for me it's really the poster child of like unhealthy food <laughs> Like you just mentioned it yourself. And maybe it was to lead into this, this conversation, but a lot of people will be like, Oh, you're so unhealthy. Like, are you eating ice cream all the time? But it, it doesn't, the reason why ice cream is often perceived as unhealthy is because it, it's been bastardized. It, it's been taken by large businesses, commercial entities, and they've completely distorted what ice cream really is in its essence, in its true authentic form ice cream is a health food it's a super food that's made with cream it's made with milk it's made with egg yolks it's made with a little bit of sugar all those foods are vitalizing their nutrient dense cream and milk in their true natural raw form from an animal that's been treated well allowed to be raising grass in the sunshine is one of the healthiest foods on, on this planet 
and yolks are the same the same way. They're incredibly nourishing. That's like 98% of ice cream. And then you've got a little bit of sweetener, which is no big deal in, in like the grand scheme of things. That that is a, a real powerful food. And, and it's something that if you make yourself at home, you'll eat it, you'll enjoy it immensely, and you'll feel great afterwards. There's nothing unhealthy about that unless you're eating. That's like the only thing you're eating all day, every day. <laughs> like, tempting, but also really expensive. <laughs> so, so if I'm going to make myself some ice cream, what's the what's the ingredients and like, say, say for two people? What I do when I make my ice cream at home is, is so not everyone has access to raw milk and even few pe- fewer people have access to raw cream. But if you just get the best ingredients you, you can afford and, and can access, I use a, a cup of cream, half a cup of milk, three egg yolks, and then two to three tablespoons of raw honey. And then if I want to make it vanilla, I'll use like a third of a vanilla bean that I cut open, scrape, put the beans in, I blend it, and then I add it to the ice cream machine. So I think an ice cream machine may not be necessary, but it, it's really helpful. I will try and figure out a way to make it without the ice cream machine, but it basically involves like a bowl in the freezer that you're stirring all day, basically, <laughs> and putting back in the freezer. So the ice cream machine kind of just like accelerates that process. And then it makes ice cream. And yeah, that's that's the the process that I've figured out that works really well. It makes something that's like spoonable and also sweet and also nutrient dense and delicious. Yeah, it sounds awesome. So you just throw the the whites away from the, the egg. I just cook them. Next time I make eggs, I put them in a little jar in the fridge and then I'll make some fried eggs and just gonna add that in or scrambled eggs or something. And what about like other milks? So would you use just like cow milk or what about like goat milk or sheep milk yeah you could use any any other milk um that you wanted they're they're pretty similar there's like some variations between different milks from different animals i, I think you could probably even use breast milk if, <laughs> if you wanted if, if, if you have a wife who's, who has some extra breast milk you can make ice cream out of that if you want to go but this is a funny thing is like that probably made some people repulse like i'm not going to use <laughs> this is my use my wife's breast milk but it, isn't it funny that like human breast milk is you know, compared to some random other animals, mother's breast milk is, is the one that's the most uh, outlandish, but wouldn't that be the most, like the least outlandish? I don't know. Uh, yeah. There, there's a lot of options for milk and I think they're, they're all pretty similar and, and can be used. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. When you think of it that way, it's like, you know, well, it would make much more sense getting it say from your wife than getting it from this cow that you've never met in your life. That is probably in a you know, a bit of a dirty pasture and stuff like that. So <laughs> no, it, it definitely makes sense, but on, on, on some levels, uh, the guy, one of the guys who, who woke me up the most when it came to health, um, and especially like just even talking about milk and stuff now, and like the, the process of pasteurization was, um, Paul check, I think about 20 years ago, maybe less, maybe 15 years ago, a friend of mine, he gave me this like audio sort of, um, file and it had like, all of like Paul Czech's sort of lectures on there around this stuff. And I mean, he actually almost changed how I uh, lived my life, you know, like definitely never used a microwave since listening to, to that. Um, and, uh, you know, looked at, looked at health in a very different way, you know, the materials I used to cook with um, and almost everything that's kind of in your face in the kind of mainstream. It's like a lot of that is just really not good for you. Um, was there anyone in your life that kind of like woke you up the most to, you know, living a healthy, vi- vi- vital life? Paul Cech definitely also has helped me a, a tremendous amount realize how to access vitality. Some other folks who were helpful, Mark Sisson, Rob Wolf. Um, th- those are, those are two additional ones. So those three have been really prolific in, in creating ideas around how to be happy and, and healthy and grateful for for what they shared. I, I try and emulate that their style of, of of teaching to to spread the word because it's been so life-changing for me. A lot of these ideas have just radically transformed my life as as being someone who used to suffer from a lot of diseases and come to find out that if I <laughs> just changed the way I was living a little bit. A lot of these things would just go away and most of these ideas are, are free and accessible and, and the ones that aren't are, are fairly low cost. So it's, it's great to know that these ideas are powerful, they're accessible and, and all we have to do is kind of just put them into play. 
You actually wrote about it as well, about your almost your health transformation. You said, how I went from being plant-based, depressed, and dumb to energetic, strong, and well-nourished. And then you put like two pictures of you, right? And you said, picture on the left, I'm 25, inflamed body, mind, because I was persuaded by Netflix documentaries to eat a nutrient-poor, balanced, a plant-based diet. Picture on the right, I'm 30, nourished by nutrient-dense, proper human diets of plenty beef, eggs, fish, chicken, bison, pork, and dairy. And then you wrote, I was always active and fit growing up. I ate a standard American diet, which gave me, <laughs> which gave me acne, braces, and depression. There's your sarcasm coming out. <laughs> Grateful for the health I was able to enjoy. Going paleo in 2012 did wonders, healing my acne and depression, thanks to hearing uh, Rob Wolf on Joe Rogan. So just a couple of questions around there, like the, the brainwashing of those documentaries. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's like they... They almost force people to go, like you said, you know, you went plant-based, you know. Um, I know friends that have, have watched some of those two and gone vegan, like gone from like massive meat eaters to going vegan. And, um, you know, I even watched those and I was like, okay, I'm going to try vegetarian, you know, for like six months sort of thing. So they, they, they work well, don't they, in terms of like persuading you. Really do. And they, they have a point with the factory, a lot of some of the factory farming that goes on is really disturbing and what they what i believe is is incorrect is the way that they go about solving that problem so they do a great job presenting the problem but terrible job at presenting the solution because the it's large majority of people are not going to be doing so well eating in a way that is avoiding what would be better described as like a natural human diet which is like consuming nutrient dense food which is eggs and beef and fish and that's what our species has thrived on for millennia and the better solution is is to embrace something like regenerative farming which is the opposite of factory farming where these animals are respected and treated with love essentially and then we're able to consume them after they've been living their natural diet and it's a healthy food system and, and not only are the animals treated with respect but the land is treated with respect and that to me is a really strong signal. The fact that there's more earthworms, there's more butterflies, there's more bees, there's more flowers, there's more life, there's more vibrancy. That to me is a really strong signal. Like, okay, this is, this is good. Like what's going on here. That's what I want to support. That's what I want to be a part of because you look at the vegan option, you're looking at monocrop fields. You're looking at vast fields of soy or various grains like wheat or could be something like corn. And then you've got these large, distilleries these these large machines processing these and turning it into something like a fake burger or almond milk and that that's all that's the same thing as factory farming for animals but for plants and plants they're not inert life forms they're they're sentient beings just like animals are they're worthy of respect and the best way to respect nature as a whole is through regenerative farming which does require animals beef, eggs, chickens, health, respect, love. And that, that's what I want to be a part of at the end of the day. There's a really cool documentary. I think it's called The, the Big Little Farm. And uh, it's actually about some guys, uh, a couple that they lived in. I don't know. It was like on the East Coast somewhere. And then they decided, I think they actually moved. To, it was around California. And um, they, the guy was also like a film producer. So he documented the whole thing and then he, he did a, like a documentary around it was like amazing, you know, and, uh, he, it was exactly that, you know, like the, the ecosystem is so important when it comes to animals, right. And, and farming, like they all rely on each other and you can't just like have, okay, cool. We're just going to grow soy, uh, because that doesn't work. You know, that doesn't round everything up and, you know, make everything grow properly. Um, and you can't just have cows because that doesn't work either, you know, that you need all these other things to sort of, um, you know, make the soil good and, um, you know, all, all different factors. And I don't, I, it, it's weird how like the, the extremes always kind of like seem to make the most noise. And um, the people there are so blind to actually, okay, cool. There's, there's actually something in the middle here and it's, it's, it's what's in the middle that uh, we should uh, really all be focusing on. I've watched that documentary, uh, Biggest 
yeah, biggest little farm. And I've been to that farm. It's out here in Southern California, Apricot Lane Farms. It's absolutely amazing. One of the most mind-blowing places I've ever been to. The amount of life and vibrancy on that farm is just, it's so incredible. The, the, the plants are, are flourishing. The animals are so happy. And the people there are just like glowing. And the, they were, we went on a little tour and the kids on the tour, they're like playing. They, they're Because they're just reflecting the energy. They're soaking it in. They're, they're on another level. I imagine one of those in every town. It would just change life as we know it at such an amazing level. People eating that food, people spending time there. If, if anyone listening has never been to a local farm like that, seek one out because it's an amazing experience and it will really change the way that you see food and farming and it's or just watch the documentary on biggest little farm because it, it's also incredible wow <laughs> i wasn't expecting that but that's so awesome that you've been there man it's like uh it's like a place i like i wish i could go there did you go there to work and help them or you just went to go and visit no they offer it's pretty funny they offer tours that you can it's like 45 dollars for a couple of hours to go see the operation that take you through their fruit orchard which is it's just incredible the, the whole place is incredible but the the tickets sell out like, as if it's an amazing like you know headliner concert and in like a minute so i went on to get tickets and it's like oh that weekend sold out scroll to the next one ah it sold out sold out so i like scrolled way down and got one it was yeah it's it's like a it's an event to, to actually get tickets to go and, and, and check the place out because they're so popular from the documentary, but it's, it's worth it. It's a great, great spot. Yeah. Wow. I, I can't, and that's, that, that's so cool though. You know, that is like such high demand. Do they actually, the, the husband and wife take you around or do they kind of share it out to other people? They weren't there. Sometimes they'll show up, but I think they're, they're pretty popular and busy. They have, they have like a whole crew. So they're, they're tour guides and they let us around and, and pointed out, all the the different intricacies like I, one thing I, I remember is that they so they don't use any pesticides which is part of what makes it a regenerative you know biodynamic farm but what they they do for example in their fruit orchard is that they have certain trees that don't grow fruit but those trees attract certain birds that then eat the pest so it's it's like this next level of thinking to where they're working with nature as opposed to against it it's just it's so beautiful to, to come in contact with that. There was one part of the documentary where they, I think some of the fruits, I can't remember which one it was, was like getting eaten by something. And then they were like, you know, we can't, we can't have this happen. So they released the ducks, I think it was. And uh, the ducks then started eating all the, um, the, what was it, gophers or something like that, I think it was, wasn't it? And I don't know if you remember, but they, they then like, and it was like, okay, cool. Now you can see why these you know, why this ecosystem is important and how it works. It was, it was really fascinating. Yeah. I, I think it might've been snails. I think the snail is like, uh, this, maybe the snails were eating something and the ducks were eating the snails. Yeah, everything they think about is like, okay, there's the pest here. There's an imbalance in the system. How do we bring balance to the system? And I wish I could remember like the numbers because the sheer n number of different trees and different animals that they have at that place, which is pretty small. It is not like a huge place, but it's mind blowing just the sheer diversity that they've been able to cultivate. Yeah. Oh, that's really, really cool that you, that you've done that. Um, another thing that you actually, you've written quite a bit about is, uh, the importance of like touch and, um, you know, like it feels like a lot of people are, are lacking that in their lives. Um, what is the important of it, importance of it? And like, why do you think people are lacking it? Touch is, is the mother of, of all senses. And when we touch another person or, or even a, a pet that releases oxytocin, which is a really powerful neurochemical that regulates our, our nervous system. And yeah, a lot of, I know I was lacking it for a very long time and a lot of people are lacking it. It's difficult. It's a difficult thing to, to do because you can't just go around touching people. <laughs> that's not, that's not cool. So yeah, there's, you know, there, there are a few ways. And I think the, the, piece that you're referencing that I wrote about was how non-romantic touch is almost non-existent in our culture, which, which is true and, and interesting to think about. Like there, are, you know, jujitsu is one way, but that touch is like, I'm going to try and choke you out and, and you're going <laughs> to try and learn something, which I've done jujitsu and it's great. I recommend every, everyone try it at least for a little bit to, to learn the ropes. But another way is acro yoga, which is a little bit less popular, but that's sort of a partner's yoga where you're able to 
work with someone else to, to do different therapy, which is much more therapeutic than, than jujitsu. That's like, there are ways to do that in which you're really almost working like a chiropractor, like really stretching people out and opening them up. It feels really good. But those, those are two ways to access, which touch, which to me, I perceive as a bit of an, a nutrient um, in a way that is, is really helpful. I remember when I was uh, training to be a yoga teacher in India, one of the things that they, they teach you, which now I'm just like, this is ridiculous. They, they say, oh, you know, at the end of the class or during the class, you know, when you want to sort of adjust somebody, uh, you should always ask them if they, they want to be touched and if it's okay, you know. Um, and now I'm just like, hang on. I mean, you yogis, like surely that's the essence of kind of what you do, you know. And, like, and, and that's kind of just one example of like how it's almost, almost frowned upon, you know, to, to touch a stranger. But hang on, we're, we're in this environment where it's almost part of it. Like, let's just, why do we even have to ask? Yeah, it is. I mean, I guess depending on, on where you, where you live, like it tends to be, yeah, more alarming. If someone were just like grab you out of the blue, it'd be pretty, pretty alarming. But it, it is, it is kind of, even just think about like, I guess we do this thing called like a handshake where we like touch hands and like, that's how we greet or like a high five or fist bump or like a hug. Yeah. Some people are more hug hugging. Hugging is great. Maybe. I think that's probably the best way. The most easy blue way you can just walk around like, asking people for free hugs or like, Hey, can I, <laughs> if I give you a hug or something, or just like your friends, you know, there's no reason not to hug your friends. That's, that, that's a, that's an easy one. That is, that's good for everybody. No, I'm a huge hugger, but so if I ever see you one day in person, you know, that you're getting a, a big man hug from me. So <laughs> it goes without saying, uh, but actually just talking about that, they say that, you know, like people that are older that live in like old age homes and things like that, um, you know, one of the ways that you can almost like just make their day and extend their life if you went and say visited them is literally just giving them a hug because some of these people haven't had human contact for, I don't know, months, weeks, years, whatever. Like it's, it's so important. It's, 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 it's one of the essences of being who we are. You know, you talk a lot about vitality and I think we're energetic, uh, electric beings and you know, you, you don't, people underestimate like what you can sort of give somebody purely by just sort of touching them and, you know, energetically transferring to them, I reckon. Yeah. That's really sad about the old folks home and the, the power of like, yeah, giving someone love through touch. I think it, it goes way beyond words. Love, love through touch. It's, you know, just reaching out, giving, giving someone a heartfelt hug is, there's nothing you could say that would approximate that, you know, it's, it's just, it's just such a deeper level of connection to be able to, to be able to connect with someone at, at a, a deeper level. And that, yeah, it's, it breaks, breaks my heart to, to hear that. Cause you can, it, I think it's not just, probably not just old folks. You know, I'm like, there's, I know there's a lot of young, young folks too, who are struggling in the same way. And yeah, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking. But um, yeah, we can be a part of we can be part of the solution. I, I often think about too creatively, you know, how else can we integrate touch or you know on some level beyond kind of what we talked about? I think like play is, is an interesting one where there are all kinds of games or sports or where there is touch involved. Like, and even just it, it's yeah, it's it's a difficult one to grapple with, but even even things like, like wrestling with your friends like that that's something that all animals do but it's not something that we really do you know anymore once you get past a certain age like kids will do it but like you're not going to meet up with your we're probably not going to meet up with your friends like yeah let's just let's wrestle around in the back, in the backyard really why not you know but i had a movement meet up on, on saturday uh this past week and we were just like yeah what if you know one way to, to talk about this is especially in an urban environment is like well what if you got attacked by like a crazy homeless person? Like, would you be able to defend yourself? Like, do you know any self-defense? And like, some people have more of a background of martial arts than others. And, and there's been, when you're with friends, like that's, that's a great opportunity to be able, especially if you're like, Hey, let's meet up and train. Like that's, that's a healthy way to meet up with friends and, and hang out. And then you can integrate some of that in. And, and this is something that I'm striving to do more is where that let's, you know, do a little bit of wrestling, you know, let's just play these games. Like one, one wrestling game and this is a good way to integrate it, is like okay everyone hold hold the legs you're up on on one leg and then you have one arm so one leg is holding the other leg and you're bouncing around and you're trying to push each other over 
it's like the point is like balance versus staying up. That's a fun game to play that involves touch. Another one is that you are wrestling and you start on your knees and the point is to touch the other person's foot. So you end up kind of grappling, wrestling around a little bit. And, and this is, none of this is violent or aggressive. It's play. It's like, this is natural human, human primal play. And then at some point you kind of like tip the person over, touch their foot. It's like, okay, I won, won that game. These are just games that you can play that are fun, that integrate a little bit of touch and are nourishing and, and vitalizing and really good to do. You can just do it anytime pretty much. Yeah. I like those ideas a lot. They, they are really cool, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and super important. Uh, it reminds me when, when I was uh, traveling a few years ago, I was in um, Croatia with some of my mates and uh, they, they're all South African. And uh, we, back in the day, like when we were in high school and primary school, we used to do, I don't even know what, what you call it, but like someone jumps on your back, like piggyback, you know? And um, the, guy on the, the guy on the back is responsible for trying to pull the other guys on the other guy's back down, you know? <laughs> and here we were like, I don't know, 35 year olds, uh, grown men playing these piggyback games. And it was like, it was so good. You know, we talk about, we've spoken about fun and touch and all these things. And it's just like, why, why did we stop doing that? Cause it was actually pretty cool. You know? Yes. That's a perfect example. Yeah. That's, and ah, yeah, this is the kind of thing that we have got to re embrace as a, as a collective, as a species, these things that are just like free, they're, nourishing on a deep level they're just fun they're, they're playful they're good you know you know in fitness we can realign the way that we look at fitness it doesn't it doesn't have to be this kind of thing where like wearing airpods alone in a gym it's like being blasted by all these artificial stimuli there's this really interesting concept so i had uh spoken with rafe, rafe so rafe Kelly is a guy who i don't know if you've seen his stuff but he shares a lot of things around this theme of, of play and of um human sort of connection and he talks about nourishment versus stimulation as like one of these core concepts to where we're really diverging as a species we're, we're in a lot of ways moving towards stimulation as opposed to nourishment and they really are divergent so like a stimulating foods versus nourishing foods or, or stimulating forms of entertainment versus more nourishing forms of, of entertainment and that's a really key core concept that i think is worth thinking about in a lot of areas and, and just a good way to present kind of question to, to look at these things. I like that. It, it makes you think about things a lot, actually, if you think, yeah, okay, is this stimulating me or, or nourishing me? And, you know, you just have to look at your own life and things that you do in your day. And, you know, probably a lot of them are stimulating you and not nourishing you. I, I really like that. So thanks for sharing that. Another really cool thing that, uh, that you do is you, you collect uh, plastic from beaches. Um, where did that sort of idea come from? I know you've collected about 450 pounds of weight of plastic now and going strong there. Yeah, that, that's been a couple of years project of a, a mission to get to 500 pounds. Initially, it was like, we're going to get to 500 pounds this year, but it, that's a lot more difficult than, than we realized. It's a very audacious goal, but because most of the time what we're picking up are like cigarette butts or bottle caps, which weigh next to nothing. So the beaches here in California are nice, but Unfortunately, a lot of people don't quite respect them. And then also they're somewhat downhill. So when it rains, uh, things get washed into the ocean up on the shore. And there's quite a bit of plastic pollution as a result of that. So I'd, my girlfriend and I were at the beach one day. We thought, well, this is disgusting. Let's clean it up. Let's just, you know, that would be fun. That would be cool. And did that. And then thought, I wonder how much that was. And so I bought a fish scale off Amazon for like $8 and went back, did it again, weighed it. And thought like, wow, that was, you know, 10 pounds, 20 pounds. That's pretty cool. How much could we do? Like, what if we just kept doing this as a, as a practice, as a way to give back and another one of these like free nourishing activities because it feels good to do. And that's how I got started. And I've just been doing it every time I can. Um, and yeah, have collected 450 pounds so far, almost, almost to 500 finally. Yeah, that's cool. It's, it's an awesome endeavor, you know, and it, it blows my mind. That, that people like litter still to this day, you know, like I just, I, I just never, I've never understood it. You know, even as a kid, we were taught, you know, just throw your stuff away, throw it in the dustbin because there's always one really, really close, but it's definitely, it's definitely not what everyone does. That's for sure. I've learned that, uh, that over the years. Yeah. There, there are little things like bottle caps or cigarette butts where you can kind of like understand on some level how it like maybe got just like they lost track of it, but then there's like entire take out meals of like multiple styrofoam cases of half-eaten food where it's like, okay, this, 
this is, I get, I mean, on some level, I think you have to be like compassionate or empathetic. I think like this person must be really suffering if they are operating on that level, but it's also, yeah, it's, it's unnerving to find things like that, to, to just come across all this stuff that is, it's just not right. And it's something that we can, we can kind of do. I mean, it's, it's also, we can think about this, you know, we're thinking about this on a micro level, of like one person littering and like me cleaning up this little patch of beach, but it's just like a drop in the ocean of all that classic. The, there's so, there's just so much pollution everywhere. And yeah, it's, if we can somehow create a practice or a movement around cleaning it up and, and facing it as opposed to just like accepting it, I think that's a good thing to do. I've had two really fascinating girls, um, British girls on my, on my podcast. Um, uh, the one of them, her name is um, Ellie Mackay, and she has a business called Ellipsis Earth uh, where they have drones and these drones are able to uh, pick up like where all the plastic is like underneath the ocean. And um, she was like, ah, um, there's, there's actually no points in picking up uh, rubbish, like say you and me doing it. Because it, it does, like you were saying, you know, it's like it, it literally, it, it doesn't ma- actually make a difference when you know how much plastic there is um, out there. So uh, that I was like, wow. But anyway, her company is really awesome. Like they're actually, what they're trying to do is they're trying to partner with, say, big corporate companies, like say Coca-Cola, for example. Because what they can do is their technology can identify, okay, cool, well, that's a that's a Coke bottle, you know, like from wherever their drone is. They're like, oh, well. And then they'll send a thing to Coke and they'll go, just so you know, you guys have 15,000 tons of um, bottles that we've identified in the bottom of the ocean. Um, you know, are you going to help sort of uh, clean this up or sort of thing? So she's really sort of smart in terms of how she's trying to uh, position herself rather than uh, making the corporate companies like, you know, say you guys are just evil. Uh, she's like, how can I actually work with you? Because ultimately that's what we need to do. You know, we, we can't just sort of point fingers at each other. We actually need to do this together, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, that is really cool. I'm going to listen that, listen to that episode because it, that sounds fascinating. And I think one, one part of this that is worth speaking a little bit about, you mentioned it, it not being worth it and like logically, economically, yeah, it's, it's definitely not worth it. We could say the same thing about voting, like voting is a complete waste of time because your vote doesn't matter. And I think there's a there's a deeper level to this that is really fascinating to me. Just on a like as a as a guy who appreciates like the esoteric, there's there's this there's this concept called morphic resonance, and it's the idea that we're all connected through a collective consciousness. And if I choose to do something, that action ripples through the collective consciousness, and it then becomes easier for someone else who may have never met me may have never come across anything that I've done to then make that decision as well, simply because there's been a rift and a change within the collective consciousness. And you could add another layer to this through social media by the fact that I'm posting about it. Some may say I'm like self-aggrandizing the act or like say, oh, look at me. I'm I'm so like good and virtuous, you know, virtue signaling the fact that I'm picking up garbage, but that also has a ripple effect. People are going to see that and then may they may decide to go clean up some garbage or, or maybe they don't buy the plastic thing that they don't need. And ultimately, these things do pile up and, and accumulate. And, and every small action, I believe, ripples through time and space and, and has an impact. And it, it's worth doing even just for the individual level because it feels good psychologically to contribute to society. It's this process called the helper's high, which comes from being of service to community. And that's a powerful suite of neurochemicals that just increase my ability to feel good about being myself. No, I mean, I, I totally agree with you, you know, and, and she, she agrees too. It's, she was just saying that like, you know, when you know how much there is, but I totally agree. Like there's this, there's this almost karmic factor to it. You know what I mean? Like I truly believe like any sort of positive, um, whatever action that you kind of put out there, as long as you're not like, I'm doing this because I want to receive something, as long as you're just doing it because it's the right thing to do, uh, the world and the universe somehow repays you. You know, it's, you, you never know how, um, but it, it might just help you in some sticky situation that you um, might've got yourself in in the future. Like 
this this karmic energy sent you down a different road or you took a wrong turn and it actually helped you. You know what I mean? Like I think every sort of small positive action is is a um important thing. So I totally agree. Yeah, that's it's difficult to to even we can take that in so many different avenues, you know. It's such an interesting idea that I really love thinking about. And when I can remember that, it, it's great because there are like for example, and, and it feels weird sharing these. But like, there's this guy on, in a wheelchair and it was, I was riding my bike and he looked at me, he's like, how oh, can you help push me up the hill? But I was like, I wanted to get home. And I was, it's just like riding my bike. It's like, I don't really, I don't know this guy. Like, you know, who, why would I stop and push you up the hill? But I was like, okay, you know, I can't say no. So you, know, you pull over and, and you'll park the bike and like push him up the hill. And he's like, so appreciative. And it, he's like, so nice. And it's just, why would I even, why did I even second guess stopping to help this guy? <laughs> so, like, what is wrong with me? And, and it just like really helps me to help him. Yeah I, yeah, I totally get it. But it's like so weird. You almost like, you question yourself. You're like, why did that thought even come into my head? Like, what a dickhead. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, but listen, um, as, we, as we sort of um, close up here, uh, you work as a vitality coach. Um, do you want to maybe... Uh, speak a little bit about that. Um, and then the second part of that is you you work donation-based and I'd love to find out how that works for you. So I, I offer that. It's not my primary source of income by any means. And in fact, I don't think I've ever earned any money from that, but I, I do have that opportunity extended for anyone who wants to connect with me through that just because I I feel like I have some responsibility to to, to offer that to, to the world if, if anyone felt called to to connect with me through that through that lens um but i've met some really interesting people through that and that those connections have been have opened up other things and and that's been that's been cool um and that was something i learned through reading charles eisenstein's work who is, which has had a profound impact on me just overall he's written such an amazing thinker and author and um so that's kind of the story behind that yeah i i really like charles eisenstein i, I think i first heard him on rich roll actually and then I read, I think it was actually around COVID when it started or something like that. He wrote this like pretty insane piece and um, that got me kind of onto him. That's kind of where, I, you know, my memory's quite bad, but but I think that's what where it was. <laughs> yeah, and similar, I think, similar story. His, he wrote one book called Sacred Economics, which is like really deep and good. And another one that was very impactful for me was The More Beautiful World, Our Hearts Know as Possible, which is a shorter book, uh, more poetic, but also highly recommend uh, accessing that one. That was a very, very powerful book for me. So Case, if people want to get in touch with you, uh, what's the best way for them to to find out and get in touch with you? You can Google my name and my social medias will pop up. Feel free to connect with me. Feel free to shoot me any kind of questions or, or comments. Happy to happy to reply. And um, yeah, thanks for thanks for the conversation. I really enjoyed it. No worries, man. And just my, my last question for you is, uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Being playful being full of vitality, having meaning in life, giving back, and a lot of things things that we talked about. You did an amazing job but outlining outlining a lot of my what I what I strive to share and and thank just being grateful as well. You know, coming full circle to where we started our conversation. I think that's a fundamental part of it. And appreciate you for being ridiculous human and bringing that out in me as well. So thank you really grateful for it no worries bud cool man i just wanted to say like a quick uh, a quick thank you i i feel like we are these like long lost brothers to be totally honest with you and um we we were kind of separated somewhere along the line but um you you're a truly great guy and i i find your information that you're sharing um fascinating you actually got me uh training more outside again now like i literally try and do every session i can outside barefoot shirts off uh, in the sun and uh you know like i you're you're just such a such a fascinating bloke and um have a very fun cool energy that i think really sort of um attracts people to you so keep up the awesome work i you know i i just uh yeah i wish you all the best and and thanks again for your time man you you're just a, a legend of a bloke deeply appreciate that Glad to see, glad to hear you. That makes me happier more than anything is when people start training outside. It's like, like you just said that. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And that was, that was a pleasure. Appreciate it. Tremendously. Cheers, bud.